another early participant in the student body for the jazz or the Afro American uh, department was um, Ricky Ford. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did he get discovered? And uh, what what was the impact of his you know presence? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how he got discovered, except he, <coughs> excuse me, he and a bass player named Boots Mailson were good friends, and they. Uh, might have come to the conservatory initially through the community education program or the extension division, I'm not quite sure, but they certainly, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, uh, became very much a part of the jazz program uh, there. And uh, obviously Ricky went on. I haven't heard much about Boots in, in years, so, but I know he's still around. He is yeah. around. In yeah. fact, I, I need to sit down with him. <coughs> okay. Dave Stewart as Dave well. Dave Stewart, yeah. You know, yeah. Those guys were, yeah. uh, were kind of all peas in That's right, right. And and Kathy Farmer was Dave's wife. I mean, they, they, the, the girlfriend and, and wife. Uh, yeah. But anyway, <coughs> uh, so that's how, as far as I can remember, how they got to the conservatory. And again, Gunther had heard both of them play. Uh, I never heard them play until till they, they came to the conservatory. And then we knew right away that, you know, they were both good players and that Ricky had some special gifts. And, um, and we've seen that blossom, you know. To, to, I think he's still in the Middle East somewhere, isn't he? Wasn't he teaching in Turkey or someplace like that for a while? Well, he, he lives in Paris, I believe. He does live in Paris. Yeah. But I think he was running a program or part of a program in the Middle East somewhere for some number of years. In Dubai or something like that? It may have been. It may have been. Yeah, I didn't yeah. hear about that. Yeah. Also, he was associated with Brandeis for a minute. I yes, think, yes, I didn't know that. That's right. Um, so uh, eventually, I think you had enough uh, enrollment for a big band yeah. by 71, I, I would think, because of that photo that you, you <coughs> By 71 or 72, yeah, I think yeah. We, we had. And again, it was a combination. If you look at those those that picture, it was a combination of of kids who came to the conservatory to be in the jazz program and students who were already there, some of them black and some of them white. As I remember, and, and I have never followed through on this and I said I was going to, one of the trumpet players, white kid in that band, went on to become uh, the trumpet teacher at Juilliard and the trumpet, the, princip the first trumpet player in the, in the American brass quintet. And I cannot remember his name right now. Um, but he played in that jazz band. He's in that picture in the 1971, 72 uh, New England NEC jazz band. Yeah, it it may come to me before we leave. But but you know, wonderful trumpet player. I mean, you, obviously, and he went on to become, as I said, professor of trumpet at Juilliard and 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 the trumpet player, the the first trumpet player in the American Brass Quintet. Um, you also had Stanton Davis. And then Stanton Davis came along. Uh, yeah, can't forget Stanton. Stanton came along probably in 72. 73 somewhere in there right. and um, yeah and you know and and he had a he had a wonderful impact uh, on the conservatories uh, and, and and he was a kind of um, we had two players who came in in that early class too who were more traditionalist uh, Billy Saxton tenor player and Sinclair AC trumpet players right now, they had, uh, Sinclair and Billy, uh, Bill, uh, were good friends, and, and Bill and I still stay in touch. We, 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 we send each other messages, you know, every month or so. Just He owns a place in, in Harlem called Bill's, Bill's Place. Right. Sinclair, I sort of lost, lost touch with him. But Billy, Bill and, 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 and AC didn't get along with Stanton very well. I mean, they, they, because Stanton was a free player, a freer player, you know, Stanton sort of modeled his playing after Miles and, and, uh, but, but Sinclair, you know, was a more traditional player and so was, was Bill Saxton. Now, they, they didn't have any real animosity, but I, but they, you know, they, they, they often gave little digs at each other, you know, based on, on what they, what they played and the, and the way they played. And Sinclair was also, had the potential, and, and, and I think probably was, I don't know if he's still playing anymore, a, a really good lead player. And Stanton wanted to be a lead player too. Stanton wanted to do everything. He wanted to be Miles, and he wanted to be you know, Ernie Royal. He wanted to be every, you know. And, and, but Sinclair had, had better chops 
Hello, Stanton. Sorry, had better chops from that standpoint in terms of range. Yeah. Than, but uh, but you know I always loved the, the way Stanton played, and and uh, I had a group for a while uh, uh, called the New England New Music Ensemble, and Stanton. It was me and Stanton as the horn players, and various rhythm section players at the time. Uh, the late Tom McKinley on piano, uh, John Lockwood on bass, Tommy Campbell on drums, Les Lumley on congas. Yeah, and so we played all over New England. Uh, we, we, and so it was a fun group because again, uh, they were really great players. But. Um, but we had those two guys there, and 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 Stanton came in uh, probably '72 or something like that, mm -hmm. and St and and Gunther liked him a lot, which was fine, and I liked him, and 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 they, uh, you know, Bill Saxton uh, had had led a kind of rough life. He grew up on the streets in New York. Uh, Sinclair, you know, I, I don't think he led the same kind of rough life, but he, you know, he was black black kid growing up in New York, <laughs> wasn't easy. But um, they helped us, I remember, get a handle on a program which I was very proud of, and I'm, I wish the conservatory had continued it, but it needed a champion. And once I left the program as sort of the chair, there was nobody to champion it. And that was the early release program we had with the prisons. Mm -hmm. We had a, we had a, with Walpole Prison and, uh, what's the other one? I, I remember we had a program at Walpole. And George Russell actually went out and taught a class at Walpole Prison, and Jackie Byard went out and taught some. And we brought in t three or four guys from early release. Now these were guys with low, uh, con you know, felony, yeah, conviction. You know, maybe it was drugs, maybe petty larceny, or something like that. But you know, uh, so, but once they got hooked up with the conservatory, and the conservatory vouched for them, they you know they got out and came to the conservatory. We had a certificate program that we started if, uh, essentially for those early release prisoners. Now these were grown men, these weren't, these weren't for the most part kids, I mean these were you know, uh, adults. And some of them played well enough, you know, and we had them in the program and some of them did well. The, you know, the recidivism, recidivism of those kinds of programs is, is really in those kinds of programs is very difficult to gauge because you know, one of the things we worked with a sociologist when we had these guys coming out, you know, who, who said to us, look, you, you remember, some of these guys have been incarcerated for four, five, six years. You know, for that period of time, they're told what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Now you're suddenly going to let them loose without much transition, uh, and they, some of them are going to have trouble adjusting. adjusting. And, and that was the case with, 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 the, with a couple of them. They ended back in, in the joint or whatever. But Billy and Bill, Bill Saxton <coughs> had spent some time in a similar situation in New York. You know, low level, whatever it was, it was, certainly wasn't any, you know, <laughs> he wasn't a murderer, he wasn't a, you know. So he helped, he helped me at least to understand some of the psyche of, of some of these, these guys that were in this early release program. And like I said, once, once I left the program, nobody else championed it. So it, it really just sort of died. Yeah. On the vine, yeah. Webster Lewis was involved in that too, to yeah. some extent. So, um, Sid Smart also was one of the early uh, well, drummers. Well, yeah. Sid. Well, he wasn't. He wasn't one of the early drummers in, in our program. He worked through uh, Webster's Webster's program. He wasn't through wasn't through the Conservatory Jazz program. Okay. But yeah. Um, let me just backtrack just a bit because sure. I'm recalling that there was actually uh, some program that was developed or tried to uh, that associated the NEC with um, Tanglewood for their summer program and that for maybe two summers you maybe were involved with that with Dave Baker and George Russell. Right. And can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that was early on. I mean, I, we hadn't even started the jazz program when we did that. Uh, it was 69, I think it was 68, 69, 69 60, or 69, yeah, 70. that's right. And uh, yeah, uh, Dave Baker, uh, George, and my and myself, we, we were at Tanglewood for that, that summer teaching, uh, you know, ensemble classes, you know, small group things that we, we did, uh, and George teaching the concept, which is all George ever wanted to do. 
<laughs> and uh, and Dave Baker, you know, in a more general way, teaching jazz theory and improvisation. And I taught the, the history, uh, uh, you know, black music history, black history, kind of component to it. And yeah, those those were two good summers, and uh, it, it was it was very funny uh, that relationship. Uh, that's when I, even though I knew Baker. When, uh, when I was at Indiana, because he had come to take over for Jerry Coker uh, my last year there. And, uh, uh, and George, that's where I first met George, so I didn't know him. I mean, I knew his, knew his music, you know, I, mean, yeah. I knew who he was. But it, so I, probably I was just awest, you know, starstruck <laughs> at the whole thing. But I remember your dad calling me that first summer. I was living in a small apartment in Brookline, I was between marriages. No, 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 I wasn't. No, I was still married because my we lived when when I when when I was at Tanglewood, we lived on top of of a mountain called Greylock. Yeah, and that was a long way from Tanglewood. But Where I used to Pittsfield. yeah, I used to drive. As a matter of fact, I rode a motorcycle. And I told you the story about the motorcycle, you getting your dad back on the, getting your dad on the motorcycle. Yeah, you tell it again. But I, I used to drive my motorcycle from Mount Greylock to Tanglewood every day and back. And <clears throat> I had a Volkswagen. I had a Volkswagen Beetle. And your dad didn't drive. And he'd say to me, can I call you sometimes? Sometimes your mom could take him to Tanglewood and sometimes she couldn't. I mean, you, you guys were little tykes. And, and he said, if I call you sometime, can you stop by and pick me up? You know, and I said, sure. So I had to make sure that on those days I took the car rather than the motorcycle. Somehow this one time I ended up with a motorcycle and I thought your mom was gonna have a fit. I can remember <laughs> that. And, but she let him go. And he so wrote, in other words, you came to the house to pick him came up. Came to the house to pick him up yeah. on the motorcycle. Yeah, I think by that time we were living on the lake. Um, could be, lake could be. I just remember, I remember, you, yeah, your yeah. mom told me to, to always leave enough time to have breakfast. So I would, I would come and have breakfast, except for that one morning. She wanted me out of there. <laughs> so did, did he end up on the motorcycle? Yes, no. yes. Oh, I, I came careening, you know, he came careening into the parking lot at, at, uh, at Tanglewood with your dad hanging onto the back of the one. It's like, <laughs> I, I hope that you called my mother just to say, hey, everything's good. And oh, yeah, no, yeah. as time went on, I mean, yeah. your mom was a delight, and she, you know, she, she forgave me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, so, so but that Tanglewood experience was, was really great. But I was saying, I was living in Brookline in a small apartment with, with, my, with my wife and daughter at the time, and your dad called, and he said, um, when is the last time you saw Dave Baker? I said, I don't know. At the time, probably had been a year or longer. And he said, well, he said, Dave just got here to Tanglewood, and you're coming up next week. He said, uh, do you remember him having a head full of hair? And I said, uh, no, Dave Baker was going bald the last time I saw him. He said, well, not anymore. He says, he's got a head full of curly hair. And I thought your dad, I said, oh, geez, maybe, maybe Gunther didn't pay him much attention, you know. I mean, not, no way. I get there, of course. Dave's got this <coughs> fro that he's bought and put, you know. And, and like everything else, not everything, but like a lot of things with Baker, he never said anything about it. Even to the point that years later I found out that, that when he first bought that fro, he uh, came home. His daughter's name was April, and he was married to a woman named Jeannie, his first wife. And so Baker went, Baker left that morning going wherever it was he was going. He comes back, and he pulls in the driveway, and April goes to the window, and she looks, and she evidently says, Ma, Dad's got a head full of hair. So Jeannie says, don't say anything, just let's be quiet about this, right? Went for a week without saying a word to his wife and his daughter, right? And I guess April must have been dying, wanting to say something. But that was, you know, Baker had suddenly this head full of hair. And it was a, and he, and he never let on. He, that, that summer, I don't think, he, no, he never said a word to me about it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it didn't always look appropriate. No. I mean, you could always tell what it was. I mean, that was the thing with the, the kind of hairdos, yeah. you know, it's like. <laughs> Billy Taylor as well. Billy yes, Taylor. exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so the connection, was it a couple weeks, that program at Tanglewood, or was it the full? It I was, was there for six weeks. Oh, you were six? Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm not. I, I, uh, Baker was there for the majority of that time. I think George was only there for like a couple of weeks or something like right. that. But I was there for six for, for six weeks because I remember again we lived uh, in Mount Greylock. Did, were you involved with some of the concerts, like contemporary concerts? Yes, as a matter of fact, um, I brought up Randy Brecker to play uh, Gunther's uh, jazz journey into jazz. journey into jazz. Yeah. I brought Randy up and and Baker played bass, and Fred Buda played drums. Yeah. Uh, I've forgotten who else played, but it was me and and. In you were playing alto? I was playing alto. So there's got to be a tenor man. There was a tenor player who played in that. Who was it? Um, I'm forgetting myself. Um, yeah, I played alto. Yeah. Well, we brought Brecker up. I remember that. Because he was replacing Clark Terry, who was originally... Who was originally... Scheduled. Yes, yes. That's right. right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I remember your dad yeah. asking me if I knew anybody. And I, Would it have been Jerry Coker? It was Jerry Coker on tenor. Exactly. Exactly right. That's exactly right. Because I think Jerry did a week, too. At, at Tanglewood. Yeah. Yes, it was Jerry Coker. Yep. But okay. Baker played bass, yeah. Um, you know, those summers were also instrumental in that Gunther was trying to, um, well, he was put in place to bring up these, uh, you know, uh, these more popular concerts. They were called popular trends concerts. Mm hmm Or contemporary trends concerts. And, mm -hmm. of course, um, Famously, he would triple bill these concerts with Mahalia Jackson, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis Orchestra, and um, maybe Ornette Coleman and Dewey Redmond. Right, 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 yeah. right, 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 right. So I don't know, you probably were... <clears throat> well, I was at some of those performances, yeah. But I, I, I don't think I played in any of those. But I remember playing in the... In the the journey into jazz. That was probably um, Tango It on Parade. Yeah, those, okay. Those All right. Things. Yeah, yeah, right, right. I don't know who would have been the narrator. Could have been Skitch Henderson? Uh, uh, yeah, we'll have to look that up. Um, yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. I don't remember. Um, uh, so another billing was the Modern Jazz Quartet, uh, Judy Collins. Mm hmm. <laughs> And Don Ellis Orchestra. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, 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 and right. Some of that was televised for WGBH. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. There's Gunther introducing Judy Collins, and it's just such a funny mix of people. And, uh, yeah, but you know, it worked. It, yeah, yeah, it worked, and I think you know, lots of people, lots of people in the orchestra, you know, in those days, and maybe it's less certainly these days, yeah. uh, but a lot of them were really not in favor of it at all. I mean, they 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 thought, you know, I mean, I, I think. Concert master at the time was a guy named Joe Silverstein, right? And I don't think Joe was very happy with any of those kinds of things at all. Yeah. I mean, he he and I always got along real well. I because I'd, I'd done a lot of, <clears throat> um, I'd done a lot of spot things with the, with the with the BSO, and and particularly, I, and this wasn't involving Joe, but when um, uh, Harry Ellis Dixon used to be the uh, children's concerts conductor and they would hire me to come over and we would play children's things. I remember doing a thing with Andy McGee one time, brought in Andy McGee and Herb Pomeroy and me yeah. and we played uh, some tunes <laughs> that, that we arranged. But uh, but Joe Silverstein was always very, you know, very polite to me and very, you know, in, in a friendly way and not, you know, not a not a gratuitous way at all. And did you have any encounters with Leonard Bernstein? Never did. Okay. No. Because the, the, the three of them, Leonard Bernstein, Sergio Zhao, and Gunther, were the triumvirate. You know, right, right. I did artistic directors of Tanglewood right. at that time. Yeah, I did did get to know Sage. Yeah, but but never. I mean, I I was around when Leonard Bernstein was there, but I I I, I never interacted with him. I never was played the, with him. Was the jazz program actually on the grounds of Tanglewood, or was it like at Windsor Mountain? It was on the grounds. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I I know my brother remembers actually. Yeah. It was on the ground in, in what was called the big house, and I remember <laughs> Baker coming out of there storming one day because somebody had come in and said there would be no jazz in the big house. 
you couldn't play jazz in the big house. And the main house. The main house, yeah. yeah. And uh, he was livid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your dad took care of it, but it was like, yeah. you know, <laughs> this is one of those things. And Jim Whitaker was there. Jim or... Whitaker was the, so, you know, the, the supervisor of logistics and all of those kinds of things, like he was at the conservatory. Yeah. And Carol Woodward. Carol Woodward. Yeah. And John Wolf, I think. Maybe well, John Wolf maybe. came later. I yeah. mean, and I, you know, again, over the years, I never made any connection with them until, you know, what, a dozen years or so ago right. when I found out they were together. And I thought, boy, you know, John was a clarinet student. He was a student at the conservatory, you know. And I know. I'm, I'm going to sit down with him. Yeah. Um, this brings up this, this moment now at, at the conservatory where... Um, Gunther suddenly had to go to the hospital. I think it was a hernia operation. And he may have, I don't know, if, you know, hernia operations are outpatient operations by now, but maybe back then he had to spend a week in. to recover. And yeah. in that time, um, something happened where Don Harris took over. Right. And do you know the circumstances of all that and why it happened? And, not really, not at least. I mean, I, I'm just conjecture and 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 rumors about what was going on behind the scenes. Um, again, Don Harris uh, had his skills, and you know, he had some repute in the in in the musical world as a composer, and he he'd written some written either some books or something like that. But I never had much truck with him. I mean, I'll just be honest. I mean, I I didn't. I didn't dislike him, but he wasn't the kind of person that I really wanted to have much to do with. And uh, and I always got the feeling that he was just, you know, he was on his wife's coattails. I mean, that whatever she wanted is what, what went down. And I know that she was probably more ambitious than he was, but again, you know, I'm just, that's conjecture in my own personal observations, you know. Why do you think she was the power or the the, uh, I don't know, the instigator behind all this. Uh, what was her angle? And well, I think she she felt that Don should be president of the conservatory. I mean, she and this was again because of her own ambition. I mean, I'm just again, this is conjecture. Her own ambition that you know, if 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 they could do a sort of a sort of internal coup, and and while while Gunther was incapacitated, that she would then rise to the you know the, the first lady status or something. You know, which is stupid. You know, that's, the, but again, I have no evidence of any of that. This is, that's just conjecture and my sense that she was always pushing him. Well, um, okay, so now we're kind of in the mid-70s. Oh, yeah, I, w I wanted to ask you, you know, uh, by the time George was there and Jackie was there, each had their chance to, to do something with the big band. You know, was that per, se per semester or was it at simultaneous? And well, I think the in the early days when both George and Jackie and I were there, <clears throat> we each uh, gave a concert a year, at least one concert a year, mm -hmm. of our own music or our own of the repertoire we wanted to do. Now, G George would only do his music, so that's fine. We understood that, so we would generally give George <clears throat> almost a full semester to do the band because it often took that amount of time for the musicians and for George to get to the point where they could, whereas Jackie and I, you know, we, we tended to do more traditional stuff, even though Jackie's stuff sometimes was really difficult. <laughs> and, but, but, you know, we could, we could make it work uh, better. When I stopped doing the jazz band, um, I think was when when we when when I stepped down as the chair, and Phil Wilson came over uh -huh. to the conservatory. Then he started to do the band. I I stepped back, and then as I said, I started doing other conducting. So I, my my time was being pulled in a couple of different directions. And I said, right. when would that have been? That would have been what 77, 76, or something like that. Well, I don't know. yeah, Phil wasn't there when I got there. So okay, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I do need to talk to Phil too because okay. I thought he was also part of the early period of uh, the formation of the jazz department. Well he came he, he came after George and Jackie that's for sure. And, okay and, yeah. yeah. And he had the Uptown Dues Band? Or he something had something like called the Uptown Dues Band right right. right. 
And Phil was an interesting guy. You know, obviously, good trombone player, pretty good writer, but uh, but he had kind of a <laughs> he had a kind of a devil may care kind of attitude about some things. You know, it was just like, uh, I mean, I tried to sort of <clears throat> you know make the transition as as smooth as possible when I stepped down. I remember just having a meeting where we announced that I was stepping down and Phil Wilson was gonna become the new chair. I think he was there at that time, maybe just teaching trombone or something. And I bought a shovel for him. I, I, I went to the hardware store, I bought a shovel and I gave it to him. I said, okay, <laughs> this is your implement <laughs> as the chair of the department, you got a shovel. And, you know, and we were just trying to make light, <laughs> light of the situation. but. You know, again, he didn't last very long because uh, I think, again, it, it just didn't, I just don't think it was a good match. I just don't think personality, what musically, per, musical issues as well as his personality, right. you know, so I don't know. Well, you also, well, either you or Gunther invited uh, a lot of uh, New York musicians to come up and do uh, like a stint with the band or maybe a master class. Um, Thad Jones, Mel, Mel Lewis, Thad up. Jones came up, and they came up actually early in the process, uh, 73, 72, something like that, that, uh, yeah, Thad and Mel came up, and uh, like they, they, they would come up for, for three or four days at a time, you know, a few times a year. I mean, there certainly wasn't any uh, extended periods of time, but, uh, yeah. And very helpful again in the recruiting process, you know. And and obviously, uh, Thad brought some really wonderful stuff in terms of his writing and his his understanding yeah. of what what made a band work. And then, uh, you know, later later on again through through grants that I wrote at the time, we, you know, we brought up oh, Frank Foster. We brought up. Uh, 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 before he died, uh, trumpet player, great trumpet player. Um, An older, uh, older gentleman like uh, Roy Eldridge type. Or? No, not Roy Eldridge. Uh, he, he was, you know, it was a rel relatively young, younger player. He was oh. in the Booker Little sort of age group. Uh, oh. um, wasn't Booker, but yeah, um, that, that, yeah. You know, it'll come to me in a minute too. But anyway, you know, we brought him up. Uh, you know, and and and. All of these things again came out of these grants that I would bring in, that I brought into the school to bring in yeah. uh, these artists. Uh, would have been Jimmy Owens or? Well, I brought like Jimmy that? Owens in at, at yeah. one one point, but that wasn't who I was thinking about at the yeah. time. Um, anyway, it'll come to me. <laughs> um, and um, at this point, then there was the development of these repertory ensembles and uh, I'd love to get your thoughts about that and what you uh, you know maybe you weren't so involved with the big band and uh, some of the jazz things you were more involved with wind ensemble but then Gunther uh, had the idea of doing the Scott Joplin material from the mm -hmm. back book mm -hmm. and that caught on and then there was the Paul Whiteman project and then mm -hmm. the Duke Ellington repertory mm -hmm. band right so uh, in general, what was your, because it caused some controversy about, you know, are you, are you playing this music and playing those solos exactly as Ben Webster played them? And, but some people didn't see eye to eye with that. So. Yeah. Uh, I, I liked the idea in general. I mean, there, there certainly, certainly were some things that, like, like the business of, of of just playing note for note solos, you know, I, I could under, I could understand, uh, you know, having the kids understand what those solos were about and, and what they were. But then I wanted to see people develop their own sense within the style. And I, you know, pro, part of the issue was that that if the kids weren't willing to stop and really understand how that particular solo from Ben Webster worked in that particular piece. When the kid stood up to take a solo, the kid was playing his solo. He wasn't playing Ben Webster. And his stylistic approach might not fit the piece. And I, I know Gunther was, 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 was religious about being sure that you, you know, that the replication of these performances, you know, were historically 
accurate. And you couldn't have some kid standing up sounding like Coltrane playing a Ben Webster solo. And so I understood the need to do that, but I was, you know, I certainly wanted to see, I hoped that we would find a way to, to, to do the repertoire and, and, and yet to allow uh, the, the, the kids to, to explore these things themselves. But it would have taken a, a lot of work. It would have taken a lot of work on Gunther's part. Uh, it would have taken a lot of work on my part to sit down with kids and say, oh, okay, here's, here's the solo, now let's understand what's happening with this solo. And, and we didn't do that. We didn't do that. The, the uh, Scott Joplin thing, on the other hand, was, was, as far as I was concerned, was spot on. I mean, because that music wasn't intended to be improvisatory. And Gunther did a great job in helping those students understand that style and the tradition that it, that it came from. So I, I thought the Red Bag Book project was, was spot on. Paul Whiteman, I, I didn't know very much of, about what he did. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I knew the music that he did. And I had an appreciation for, for it from a historical standpoint. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, there, were, there was some pushback from people who thought, again, that uh, replicating any of those kinds of pieces of those performances uh, was sacrilegious to some extent or uh, shed a negative light, uh, even from a racial standpoint. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and I know, you know that, that Gunther didn't have that as a thought. His, his thought was about music and he just, you know. I think it was more about the arrangers. Yeah, it was more, Whiteman, that's right. Know. That's right, um, and Ferdy Grofay and those guys. And yeah, yeah. Those guys, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Big Spiderback, of course. You know, right, know, right. You know, brought the, um, you know the, the ragtime thing was a big surprise, I suppose, because it really caught on immediately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, it seemed like that was kind of like the medium rare uh, big band of the conservatory at that time, that they could go out and tour. Mm -hmm. Uh, was there a bit of jealousy that if you weren't in that ensemble, you know, that the other students were left out? Or I'm not sure that there really was. I mean, I think the students who wanted to be in the ensemble, if they were playing up to, to, to snuff, yeah. they could play. I think Bo Whittaker played in that, that ensemble. And right. Bo was always an interesting little character. But I mean, he's a good player, but, but sometimes very odd uh, personality-wise. But... But I, I got along with him. I'll never forget that when he came to audition for the conservatory, it was me and Jackie and George were, were the judge, you know, were the auditioning committee. And in, in walks this white kid with horn rim glasses with tape around the middle. I mean, it's the typical, what we would now call nerd kind of looking guy. He had on some plaid pants, one leg higher than the other, and some white socks. And, and, you know, I don't forget what kind of shirt he had on. And he comes in, you know, he's got this trumpet. And so we said, oh, uh, okay, and what's your name? And he says, and what are you going to play? I don't know, he's going to play you know, all the things you are or something like that. And so we sort of thought, okay. But, but we're not expecting much. We're thinking, okay, well, this will be a short audition, right? Well, you know, he started to play, and we all sort of went, what the hell is that? You know, and because he could play. He, he, he could play. He... I think Bo got sidetracked on a lot of levels, and he never let his musical potential come out. Because he could play bebop, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I mean, here's this kid, you know, with plaid pants yeah, sure. and horn rim glasses, you know, yeah. uh, not supposed to be playing like that, yeah. you know. And he sounded like Clifford, you know, and we sort of go completely out of context. But... Uh, but no, I think the ragtime ensemble was was generally well thought of by the the, the musicians, uh, the the student musicians. I mean, I know the faculty uh, never had any any real concerns about the makeup of the group, and uh, you know there were. If you look back historically, most of those, <clears throat> many of those ensembles were mostly white yeah. with a few black players, right. and that's sort of what. what existed at the conservatory. I mean, you had Charlie Lewis playing at, a t at one time. Right. You had, he was I the think original member. He was the original member. Yeah. Uh, uh, Thomas may have played in that at one point, and certainly Don Byron, I think, played played in it, didn't he? So I think, you know. John West, you know. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So I, I don't think that there was any, 
any any concern about that. And yes, you know, did did we feel okay? Well, maybe we should have put some energy into the jazz ensemble. But remember, we'd made a department decision. This was me and Jackie and George at the time that we weren't going to go out and play at these festivals and, and, and be the typical collegiate jazz band. Yeah. I, I'm not sure that your dad would have stood, stood in the way of that, and I think he would have supported it. But we never really presented it that way, and that's what I said. When, when I came to my own realization that, that, uh, that certainly wasn't anything he was doing out of any animosity or, or any uh, malevolence you know, toward, toward us or the jazz program, that I came to understand again. For Gunther, it was about the music. It was not about anything else. And it was a bit of a coup for the conservatory, PR-wise. Oh, sure. You know, to Absolutely. get this band recognized that way with a Grammy. Absolutely. You know, so Absolutely, no. I'm sure that uh, that was also thought about and, and you know, developed. From That's right. And I think it, you know, it helped. It yeah. probably helped with fundraising and all kinds of things, you know, right. to, to have that kind of notoriety. Yeah. Uh, talk about... My brother Ed Schuler, and when he came into, because he was he came right out of high school. In fact, he didn't even finish high school. So yeah, um, that that part I didn't know, but yeah, he came in right out of high school. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, here he is, you know, he's a 16 year old or something like that, and uh, talented. Yeah. But uh, you know, son of Gunther. <laughs> well, again, I I don't have a lot of remembrance other than the fact yeah there were some people who who felt like he you know he was getting an extra leg up because he was Gunther's son but it was really because he could he could play at 60 and I, I he come at the same time as moot as boots that I mean they they came in around the same time uh, boots played cello perhaps more than he did bass at least to start but yeah I mean Ed, Edwin came in and he carried he carried his own I mean he didn't you know uh, he was he was responsive. He's, he was receptive. You know, never, never any sense that you know I'm Gunther's son, so you got to treat me differently. And and uh, you know, and Gunther made it clear in his own way that we weren't to give him or you when you came in any special privileges. You got to do what you do, and you got to do it at a level that you know. And Ed, Edwin was was that way. Um, again, with his relationship with with Ricky and and some of those other guys that were came, coming came coming in around that same time you know i think he learned a lot about about playing i don't think he'd had a lot of playing experience at that point as yeah. i remember yeah. the only thing he had was i think he he uh, would have these sessions over at the church where it ran church of the redeemer or something like that right right Dave right Stewart's right Stewart's father was a yes, pastor yes 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 and yes. then um, Rand Blake would show up late at night and sit in with them and you know they would be, have these late night sessions with wine and right, food was right. part of that Dave Stewart right 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 so there was this little group that you know came yeah they sort of came in as a as as a group you know per se right. yeah but you know but again you know uh, i remember Talking to Edwin, uh, it was I, I think it was at the um, memorial service that was held over at uh, MIT, and so after the after the performance that after the playing that night, I, I went backstage to see my to see my buddy Don Braden, and uh, and Edwin was back there, and I remember Edwin introducing me to his wife, and he said. He said, "This is. This was one of my professors at the conservatory, and I." He said something. Like, I eventually started listening to him, <laughs> so I said, "That's fine." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it took him a second. Yeah, and they would all, you know, hang out up in the organ loft. Aha! Uh -huh. Right. There were other extracurricular extracurricular activities. activities going on. Yeah. Well, we. <laughs> Yeah, we knew about those things. It was cool. <laughs> it was cool. Um, yeah, uh, Gary Valente was another person I thought maybe you, you remember him coming into the program. He was a strong personality in the Italian thing and the trombone and the whole bit, you know. Yeah, my most recent involvement with Gary really goes back now. Maybe it's been four years now, but he used to come up to play the Con John Coltrane concerts over at... at uh, at uh, Northeastern, right. 
And uh, yeah, and he was again, he was a very strong personality, both uh, certainly as a trombone player and, and, and as an individual to, certain, to a certain extent. I mean, he got to the point where you wanted to say to him, <clears throat> you know, life isn't monochromatic. I mean, you gotta, you gotta find some other things you can do with a trombone other than playing loud. And, but you, you know, but you didn't want to step on anybody's toes. I mean, he's play the way he plays. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so he played a lot with the Coltrane thing. Now he stopped playing the Coltrane thing about four years ago because he ran into some real problems. Um, yeah. You know, he, when he was with Paula Blay and uh, some other people, he, he, he ran into some financial problems and some social problems, or so, I guess. And I remember at the time that uh, Leonard Brown, who just passed away, uh, arranged f for him to get some extra bread because he was scuffling and he was going to get kicked out of his apartment or something. And um, he was supposed to pay that bread back. I'm not sure he ever did, but, you know, I think that Leonard understood where he was coming from at the time. But, yeah, Gary was, you know, an integral part of, he was, uh, there was also another trombone player who played valve trombone and um, oh, wow. um, Ed, Ed somebody played valve trombone. Well, I'm sure he was perfect for the Ellington repertory band. In terms of I think he did play in the repertory band. Yeah. That's right. Uh, what was his last name? Anyway. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so, so yeah. But 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 Valenti was was an integral part of that first sort of move, moving the jazz program from, uh, you know, I won't call it a traditional approach to everything. I mean, we we always had a kind of forward-looking thing, and obviously with George, that. Some of the some of the kids didn't take to George's music very easily, you know, because it's 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 you know it's difficult on some levels, and because it wasn't just straight top and bottom kind of charts, you know. I mean, you yeah. had to read these <laughs> signposts and shit, you know. But you know, they eventually came to understand, you know. What was your relationship with George in terms of like how he he presented his concepts to the students? Because I. I think one word that came up, one description, uh, maybe was with Marty Ehrlich, he's, he's kind of brusque with the students. Um, and I, I have my own thoughts about this because I took his class and I also played in his ensemble. Mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. what, what, do you think he was a little bit rough on, ta on, on people? Uh, and, and was that a teaching moment for the students or do you think it was a little more than, than they bargained for? It's hard to say. I think it depended a little bit on the individual students themselves. But I mean, yeah, G George could be very, you know, George's thing was, quite frankly, this is the right way and everything else is wrong. George's way was the right way. And if you, if you question that, which I did sometimes, <laughs> I guess I was in everybody's business, but, but, uh, but I, I heard some of those same kinds of things from students. And so for my own, you know, edification as the chairman of the department, I felt like I needed to know what people are doing. You couldn't just leave it to chance. And, and you know, and George, again, would, would, would sometimes say things that were intemperate, say, say things that were, were, were not very uh, uh, politic in some instances. I mean, he just said and did what he, you know, and if you didn't agree with the Lydian concept, uh, then, then you were wrong. And, and, and that, that, that I thought was too bad, but what I tried to say to students is that, you know, throughout the history of, of, of music making and music kind, you know, people have come along with views about how music operates, and they have been pretty, pretty set in that way. I mean, let's just look at the Viennese school. I mean, we have got Schoenberg, Weber, and Berg. I mean, Schoenberg was very clear about what he wanted, and if you didn't, if you didn't think that was right, then you were wrong. And George is not was not unlike that. You know, we wanted him to be a bit more forgiving uh, of of people's views, uh, but he really only really latched onto those students who 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 who, who took the concept uh, whole cloth, and 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 even if they made some changes, who was that guy's name? Uh, Gertz Tangerding, remember that name? Yeah, yeah and, and you know, Gertz was a, a, a devotee of George's and, and, and George, you know, took to him in ways that he didn't take to other students. But again, if you put a Billy Saxton and a Sinclair AC into the concept 
course, and everybody had to take it. I mean, it, if you were a jazz major, it was required. You know, and they would come to me, man, and say, man, this guy, you know, he's, you know, he's talking bullshit, man. I can't, you know, that ain't right, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'd have to try to sit these guys down and say, listen, man, just try to learn what you can from it and what you don't agree with, discard at some point, but you can't take a class and, and spend the whole time challenging you know, you can, you can challenge from the standpoint of trying to learn more and perhaps having other people understand more, but you're probably not going to change his mind about anything, so don't, don't, don't do that. <laughs> Did you, uh, were you a, a devotee of George's concept, or were there things in there that you felt like, well, that's pretty abstract, I don't know if that applies to what I want to do and how I solo and improvise? And... Uh, I know it's yes, yes and no. I mean, I, you know, in my own playing and my own my own sense of what playing was about, I certainly was more in the Jackie Byard school than I was in the George Russell school. But I learned a lot from George. I did not ever take his class, but I did sit down with him many on many occasions to go through the book, to go through things in the book, the the, the concept book that I didn't understand, or. And, and I think I always put it to him that way, rather than saying I didn't, that, that I didn't agree. I just said, I don't understand this. Can you explain this to me? Sometimes he would, and sometimes he would, he would, uh, he would brush it off, sort of like, you know, it's, it's plain as the nose on your face. Why, why, why are you asking me those questions? You know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And I think what that did, you know, we established a relationship, and I came to understand what he wanted out of his music uh, more than many people. Which is why you know he he took me to 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 do recordings and things because I could explain to the musicians sort of in their own terms. I mean George, again, like with his students, it was, he was he would be very difficult in a recording session because he couldn't find the words or didn't want to find the words to try to explain to uh, Snooky Young, you know, why he had to play the line a certain way and. Uh, so, so I think that that involvement with George again, it, though I, I wouldn't consider myself a devotee, but I think I understood the concept, or I, at least I understood what George was trying to get out of the concept right. uh, more than more than most. And even in my own private teaching, you know, I, over the years, I remember when I came out here in '78. Uh, I came out wanting to be somewhat anonymous. I mean, I, I was going to Eastman to work on my PhD. I wasn't out here to be a jazzer. I wasn't out here to be any any well-known figure. I just wanted to come. I'd been accepted, had a fellowship. I was gonna come out and do my thing and get the hell out of here. And, but you know, the word gets around and people say, hey, well, you gotta go talk to this guy. You know, he knows the George Russell stuff, which and blah, 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 blah. So I had a bunch of students my first year out here who would come to my house. I had a little studio apartment before I brought my family out uh, in town and um, they would come and take lessons. And one of the things that I did allow them, not allow them, but I introduced them to, was the whole idea of the Lydian concept. Not necessarily sitting down and, and, and replicating everything that Dave Baker had written in his books or anything, but just to give them the general concepts of how those things could be used. And then I said, now you go and figure out how to make it work for you because it ain't for everybody, you, you need to, but you need to try everything. So I have a lot of players out here who, who to this day, I mean, I, there's a trumpet player around here named Mike Kalpa, who um, I still stay in touch with, and he, he said to me recently, he said, you know, when I took lessons with you, you introduced me to the Lydian augmented scale, and told me some ways that I could use it and showed me some examples of how people used it in play. And he said, I went home that day and wrote a tune that's still one of my favorite tunes based on that. Okay, well that makes me feel good. But, you know, uh, I never never set out to teach the concept. I mean, George taught the concept and you had you had the, you know, what was that tenor player from uh, Norway or Sweden? Uh, Jan Gabarik. You know, uh, you know, he was, he was dead on with George and uh, and Stanton, Davis tended to try to be, but Stanton had his own way of kind of figuring out how he fit in all that. I think everybody had their own way. Yeah, you know, yeah, own. yeah, yeah. But, but, but was George kind of an island unto himself amongst the faculty? You know, did Jackie see anything that George wouldn't? 
Did they collaborate in any way? I think they had some mutual respect for each other, but never, never, never a collaboration. Never, I never heard. Certainly, I never heard either one of them say anything negative about each other. I mean, George would often say what a great player Jackie was, and everybody had to say that. Right. But I never had, never heard Jackie say anything about the concept, right? You know, because it just wasn't in that wasn't in his purview. And it's curious that Jackie never played any of George's music in Apollo Stompers. Right. Um, it wouldn't have necessarily been the reverse, but um, uh, what I got out of George, and I'll just be brief about this, is that uh, I thought he was a master of counterpoint in the way that he used these various lines mm -hmm. that I think even people, I think if you up, upgrade it to Steve Coleman and those guys that did those other cycles, mm -hmm. that that's where they got it from, mm -hmm. from George. Yes. I would agree, and I, yeah. for me, uh, and I've said this before to people, while I think George's use of lines and counterpoint really was extraordinary, I, I think his biggest uh, uh, and most extraordinary trait was form. I mean, George understood how to balance form over long periods of time, and, and long forms, and your dad and I used to talk about this a lot, you know, the, the great composers really understood long forms. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can't write, a, you can't be a Mahler and write, write great music if you don't understand. You can't be a Beethoven and not understand form. Yeah. And I think George had a really good, I don't know whether it was intuitive. I mean, George studied with people, but he certainly seemed to have a real, for me, a real sense of how to organize the music in a way that, that, that made it work as a piece. Was there any attempt to uh, bring Sonny Rollins to the school, or um, how about Miles? You know, uh, not really. Um, not during my time. Um, I remember a concert that Sun Ra did at. Uh, well, Jordan. Sun Ra, yeah, Sun Ra did come, and and I'm trying to remember if this was before or after. Well. The Sun Ra story is, is kind of uh, um, <laughs> convoluted to some extent. Uh, Sun Ra's name is Sonny Blunt. And Sonny Blunt grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, and he was the second piano player with Fletcher Henderson. And, and I was a kid, and I knew, I knew about this Sonny Blunt from Birmingham, Alabama, this is where I grew up, but I'd never heard him play. And then later on, when I found out, the Sonny Blunt was Sun Ra, so I thought, boy, that's a long way from Birmingham, Alabama, because those bands in those days were pretty much society, you know, two-step bands, you know. And but anyway, he, um, one of his players was a guy named uh, Jothan Callens. Jothan Callens played trumpet. Jothan had a funny life lifestyle as a trumpet player. He played with Sun Ra, and he played with Lionel Hampton, and he played them at the same time. So I said to him, how do you split your personality like that? I mean, one day you're playing, you know, flying home, and the next day you're playing, you know, <laughs> Saturn. <laughs> but anyway. Space is the place. Space is the place, right? And he said, oh, man, I just, he, he, he loved both of them. And he said, you know, I just made myself play that way. But anyway, the point I'm making is that, that, that Jothan Callan's son uh, taught viola at the conservatory, and I didn't know whether or not that was around the time that Sun Ra came. His name was Amadi Hummings. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, his, his, his wife, Jothan's wife, uh, teaches at, uh, at Eastman. She's a pianist. But anyway, but I didn't know if Amadi and, he, he and, and Jothan had a kind of an estranged relationship. But I remember when I came back to do the Monk Institute back in the 90s, Amadi was still there. And he, I remember he said to me, stopped me, and I didn't, I didn't approach him. I thought, you know, I, I, I'm not going to ask these questions. If, if it comes up, I'll, you know. But he knew that Jothan and I had been friends because Jothan was from Birmingham. And we had played in bands together in high school, and, and so we knew each other very well. But he brought it up. He said, I understand you know my dad. And I said, yeah, Jothan and I, you know, went to high school together. So I didn't know whether that was at a time when Sun Ra would have come there. Yeah. But they just did a concert. They, it wasn't like Sun Ra did a master class. Yeah, no, no, no. I know they just played a concert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But I, I didn't know what the, the circumstances were uh, with that. I remember it was a three-hour concert. It had to be. Yeah. They, they just 
it was like this art ensemble of Chicago. I mean, you can't you can't go without just spend the evening just right. yeah. <laughs> And, and, and so were there uh, times when um, I'm sure there were students who were interested in free jazz, uh, Ornette Coleman, but even Albert Eiler, or Cecil Taylor, whatever. Uh, how is that, um, you know, used in the jazz department and were there supporters of that? Obviously, you would have been fine with that, but uh, was there a separate... Well, like I said, even going back to the early days, the the the, the relationship between uh, Sinclair A.C. and Bill, Bill Saxton yeah. and, De and Stanton Davis, they were on two opposite sides of this approach to playing, you know. And uh, I think that there were always camps, uh, and and I think depending on the time, and and obviously George, you know, tried to find the middle ground. I mean, he, you know, George wrote a lot of things that were very traditional in the way that they were set up, whether they were blues or whether they were I Got Rhythm t Tunes or whatever, but using George's approach to things, which, which was much more free, and he encouraged players to play freer in, in his music. Uh, so I think the camps were always there. And Rand Blake. Would and Rand Blake, of course. Would yeah, sure. Of, of course. Tom McKinley in some ways. Tom McKinley in some ways. He was our slash chord player, you know. Uh, kind of like the Kenny Kirkland of Boston is right. how I looked at it. Right. I had great times sessioning with him at his house. You know. uh, we used to have some hell of a times. We used to play, we used to go up to, uh, he lived in Reading right. at the time, and, he, and there was a drummer that had moved up here from Pittsburgh, yeah. uh, Roger Ryan. Ryan. And Roger was a kind of he just wasn't, he, Roger just played the drums. He, he played the drums and watched uh, soap operas. You know, but we would go up there and we would spend all day, me, Stanton, John Lockwood, uh, McKinley, and, uh, and sometimes Les Lumley. We'd go up and we'd spend the whole day just playing, just, you know, and, and it, was, it was great, it was wonderful, a lot of levels. Uh, Roger was my second drum teacher. My first uh -huh. drum teacher was Fred Buddha. Oh yeah. Uh, who I liked, but I thought it was I, I wasn't ready for it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then Roger Ryan comes along for two years, and boy, it was this free concept and taking cells and working with that, and that it was suddenly my my technique went out the door. Oh, okay. <laughs> Right. And, and then Pat Hollenbeck was the one who actually got me back in shape. Yeah, Pat was a good player. Yeah, he was a good he teacher. Was really, he got me yeah. back to the beginning, and okay. my, my form was all out of whack, and right, right. He, he straightened it out. So. Yeah, Roger was just, uh, you know, he was a free spirit. I mean, and, and he and McKinley fed off each other, see? Yeah. And, uh, you know, Roger Roger could play with, with, uh, with uh, McKinley, and, and McKinley would encourage him to have this kind of, you know, a, approach to things, and we were enjoying that again in this in this particular band because we wanted to have some of that kind of looseness. I mean, I was playing a lot of bass clarinet in those days, and uh, we had some really wonderful, wonderful programs. But almost always, you know, uh, weed laced. I mean, them guys smoked more weed than. <laughs> I wasn't the big pot smoker, but man, we we go to these we go to these concerts, man. These guys would show up and it'd be like, wow. <laughs> but anyway, they do played. You, do you know the circumstances of why Roger uh, left? No. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I I feel like I've, I've covered as much as, uh, and I'm sure you. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're getting, uh, set up with all my questions, but it's, no, it's, been it's quarter of two now. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. probably going to have to right. to uh, move on. But uh, yeah, I mean, I you know, some of these things come back to me. Like I said before, we talk about one thing, and I remember remember something else, and 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 some of it's like a a wave, and when I, you know, this isn't about me, but but when I think about. <clears throat> where I came from, where I started, and and the many wonderful musical experiences, and personal, but many wonderful musical experiences I've had, you know, a lot of it had to do with your dad. I mean, it just, you know, he he believed in me, and again, at a time when there was no reason to. I wasn't any, you know, I was a 22, 23-year-old recent graduate 
of college. I mean, yeah, I'd done some playing with this person, that person, but it was, you know, I would, I would fear hearing what I sounded like <laughs> in those days. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, but, but, you know, he had, he, he believed in me, he believed in, in, in what, what I could do, uh, both in terms of music and from an organizational standpoint. And I can remember sometimes sitting in the group of chairs, a council of chairs, sitting there, and around this table were all these people who were pretty well known in the musical world, and they were the chairs of the voice department, the theory department, the composition, blah, 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 blah. And here I was sitting, and I'm thinking to myself, damn, I always laugh. My, my favorite catchphrase about understanding or grounding myself to some extent is that <clears throat> my first musical performance was when I was in the third grade playing third clarinet on a piece called To a Wild Rose. And I can remember that performance like it was yesterday. And so when I, and, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not big on myself. I mean, I, I've gotten to the point where I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm, I don't have a lot of false modesty. But when I sometimes will lean over into saying, well, you know, I've done this and I've done that. I think the only thing this really is is that it's a long way from the third clarinet part on to a wild rose. And that's, that's good. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, but 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 I will always consider the 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 opportunities your dad gave me, uh, and 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 the people at the conservatory because that that faculty was really very welcome, welcoming to me. Remember, you know I was one of maybe well I was the only black faculty chair at the time, and here we were starting a program that not running counter to what most of them did, but it was certainly something different. So they had their view of, of Gunther, and then they had the view of me because I was, I was Gunther too, because I'm sitting there around the Council of Chairs, you know, uh, arguing for this, that, or the other. And I think part of it had to do with the fact that I wasn't always just arguing about the jazz program. I mean, I, I, I was savvy enough. I mean, I had a degree. I, I wasn't stupid to classical music, and again, I had been a performer. So I could talk their language. They couldn't talk mine. And that, that unnerved some of them. But I think for many of them, like Bob Cogan, uh, now there was an interesting relationship. I mean, your dad and Bob Cogan didn't like each other at all. And I liked both of them. And I had to sometimes listen to your dad complain about Bob Cogan, and I had to listen to Bob Cogan complain about your dad and keep my mouth shut because I liked both guys. I, I never really got to the crux of why they disliked each other, but I... <laughs> No, they did. Was he part of the old guard? Uh, was he, he was there. Gunther? He was there. He was there before Gunther. Yeah. He was there before. So yes, it may have been been some of that. Right. But uh, uh, but but all those people, you know, again from you know Mark Pearson, who was the chairman of the the voice department, to Russell Sherman, and then Russell and I had a really warm embrace at your dad's memorial thing at at Jordan Hall. I mean, he made a point to come to me. You know, and 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 you know, I, I, it brought a tear to my eye because it was this guy who, you know, who I admired. I mean, I heard, loved his playing. I mean, just God, you know. And he's coming to me and saying, you know, we really miss a person like you at the conservatory. You know, and I'm thinking, jeez, you know, I'm gonna cry right here. Let me stop. But you know, but that range of people, yeah. you know, and uh, uh, all of that, going back to the third clarinet part on Two of Wild Rose. <laughs> Yeah. So, but well, you're, you're just one. Uh, sure. Two more minutes. Sure. You were. We were just talking about the third string briefly, but uh, your thoughts about those efforts, and, and I'll just say that Gunther didn't initially want to call it third string. Uh -huh. There's evidence that you know it, it became this this thing that sort of took him by by surprise mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. of a, a headline. Yes, I remember reading that in the book right. in his in his biography. Yeah. And and so that was used as a noun, whereas I think he wanted to use it as an adjective. Yes. And, and so right, right. then it was accepted, and I think he rolled with it. Yeah, yeah. But, but in terms of all that, uh, there were those attempts early on that some of it worked, some of it didn't. And uh, 
um, but he was trying his best to get the, the classical guys to swing and the jazz guys to read. And so just briefly, if you have any thoughts about that. Well, again, I, I, I eventually came around to it. I think I told you, I mean, early on, I, I had some misgivings and I expressed them to go there. <coughs> you know, I said, jazz was always third stream. Why, why do you need to, to call it third stream? And I don't think he spent a lot of time trying to justify it to me at the time, but he's, but, but, you know, but I remember him saying, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking about, we're trying, what he thought he was doing, and I think it was, a, it was an admirable thing, was really to, to, to raise the level of people's consciousness about jazz, that, that, that jazz was sort of, had this sort of low culture thing um, in, a, in a many segments of our society. And, and, and your dad's thing was this music is just as valid as anything on the classical side. So when we bring the two of them together, we're elevating both. But I think he felt he was elevating jazz, you know, to, to his proper level. I mean, I'm not sure that, yeah, I, 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 I felt that way. And uh, so I came to, <clears throat> to understand what he wanted to do, do with it. Didn't always like the music. Sometimes the music just didn't sound like it. It sounded to me again, sometimes like trying to get classical guys to swing. And if you don't swing, if you don't know how to, if you can't swing, you ain't gonna, <laughs> you ain't gonna learn in one session or two. But It's true. I, I think if there's a performance of Transformation, which is a, a great piece, but if you don't have a jazz bass player and a jazz drummer in that piece, that's right. then it sounds really stale. And I got first wind of that um, uh, there was a performance at Berkeley. Eric Hewitt was leading the Berkeley ensemble in trying to play that play piece, and he had some classical guys from the Boston Conservatory because they had just merged. Right. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, Didn't work. Oh boy, this needs to have yeah. real cats right. playing. Right, right, right. And I think the, you know that's that's what made the MJQ work. You know, when you when you know when you when you had a Percy Heath land down the line, you know everything else you know could work around that. And, and even sometimes when John Lewis f sounded out of his element to some extent. I mean, John was a great musician, but, but playing sometimes I felt like he was, he was being t tepid or timid, but Percy never let it be. And, and, and the same thing with Bags. I mean, obviously those guys, but it was always Percy Heath that I, yeah. that I pointed to. So you were right about the bass line. I mean, I, the the good performances again that I've heard of of, of and played of of, of uh, the Paul Clay stuff, those movements where a bass player has to be able to play. If you got a good bass player, it makes the movements come alive. When you have a bad bass player or uh, have a classical classical guy who's <laughs> doing that, you say, right. okay, well that ain't gonna work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. but uh, but anyway, so like I said, I I'm not. You know, I'm not out proselytizing for third stream. I'm not even sure that the term is even well known or used by by people yeah. in 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 the musical worlds these these days. But uh, well, it's, it covers all sorts of music. it covers all it's kinds of music now. Combined. That's right. That's right. Well, world music has now become the catch-all yeah. for for everything. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for thank you. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for really doing this. I give me a chance to relive some wonderful moments.